We are honored to host previous UX conference attendees at our NNG participant panels to share their tips and applied learnings. Here's our panelist, Aidan Lozanis, a customer experience director in London, to share her research repository in our 2021 virtual participant panel. Hi, yes, my name is Eden, and uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm the CX director at Cambridge University Press. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about research repositories for cross-functional teams. And I picked this topic because uh, most product teams don't actually have access to research repositories or real-time data. They can only get a snapshot of the research when they get the reports sent to their mailboxes. Hopefully they actually read them, um, but most of the time it's really hard to di digest all of that. And uh, I learned that it's, it's best to uh, share um, the process as well and get everyone on board so they can um, learn everything on the go. But it's quite challenging because particularly with qualitative data, when you share large amounts of it, it can look like that. There's extremely convoluted file folders, Excel sheets. It's very, very texty. And unlike quantitative data, there's no visuals that you can use. There's no graphs or diagrams that you can use to share. So people can immediately, you know, grasp what, what you're um, trying to, to, to communicate or the, you know, the insight there. So it doesn't really work. So what will work? What do we actually want from a research repository, right? So, you know, from my perspective, what I wanted is everything in one place. I don't want to open different files and different folders and Excel sheets. I want it all to be in one place. And ideally, if I'm not asking for too much, all the high level information for the senior managers is going to be hosted in the same exact place as all the details and uh, er everything that everyone else needs uh, to support their day to day. There's quite a lot of ingredients that we need to include. So ideally optimize information architecture. So a dedicated space for the user information, the product information, the data itself and how the data is being labeled. Ideally also ability to navigate the information easily and ability to search the information easily. So overall, that's what I was looking for uh, when, when trying to find the, the best solution for, for this problem. Or in other words, um, some sort of a visualization tool. So user research is quite similar to a detective work. Uh, so the ideal is to move something um, you know, to, to move a step towards this type of a thing where you can see all the different pieces of information, everything is visualized and it's kind of like in front of you. But the problem is with the amount of data that we uh, handle, it's more likely to look like that. <laughs> so um, our tool of choice was Miro back then. We decided to choose it because there's, we can use sticky notes, there's no boundaries. So we don't have to use this like really small cork board. Um, and we know that there's always going to be enough space for what's coming. Everyone can collaborate together, but most importantly, it's visual. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So I'm going to start from the fine details of the structure and uh, moving sl slowly, slowly to high level overview of everything. I'll start from micro to macro. Uh, so one sticky note is a point that the user made. And there's also colored labels that, uh, that are sort of like telling us what type of inf information it is, whether it's uh, a direct quote or a descriptive uh, label that's you know using the same words that the user said, but summarizing what they said. Or, and we try to avoid that, but uh, <laughs> some sort of an interpretation because what they said was actually really complex and we cannot use their words and we really have to summarize it in our own words. It's quite rare, so that's why you don't see it here. But sometimes it's kind of like our last resort, trying to extract <laughs> the meaning out, out, out of uh, what someone said. Yeah, and, and also really helpful colored labels like green for positive, red for negative, um, you know, amber for ne neutral, et cetera, et cetera. So, you can already see that it's starting to visualize the, you know, what someone said without uh, too much effort, really. 
And uh, there's also the option to view all the different points that one user said or shared with us during a user interview. Uh, in this specific example, the user is a student and the product is an online master's degree. So uh, the interview was uh, asking all sorts of questions about their experience um, taking the online course, uh, the before, during and after, it's quite a long journey, a master's degree. <laughs> the life cycle is very long, including a few specific questions about uh, the design and development of the courses, etc., etc. So if we dissect what we're seeing here a little bit and all the different elements that we see, there's the yellow sticky notes for all the different points that the users shared with us. There's the orange sticky notes for all the questions, the pink sticky notes to group questions together, and the blue sticky notes to highlight all the different phases of the interview. It looks a bit like a, a user story mapping <laughs> exercise, some sort of an affinity diagram uh, that we're trying to create here. And by doing that, we can direct marketing people, for example, to look only at the journey questions, because maybe that's what they really, really care about. Maybe that's going to be a better source for them to support their day-to-day -day activity. Uh, and because it's an online course, maybe instructional designers can look at specific questions asking about um, learning activities and what, what students found, um, you know, supportive for, for their day-to-day. So that's, that's quite helpful and, and you can direct people to kind of like focus on specific things rather than everything and because it can be quite overwhelming. There's also the option to view everything that we've got on one product. So we can zoom out a little bit and then we can see all the different user lanes, all the different interviews that we have for a specific course or again, a course is a product. And that's great because you can see, you can literally see all the different things that we know. There's like the amount of sticky notes that we have is literally all the different points that we gathered, all, all the different points that we analyzed. And this is great because some, you know, sometimes you can't direct people to specific questions. For example, product owners, they really want to know <laughs> uh, everything that's possible about, about their products. So that's, that's a great view for, for other people in the team. Obviously, we want to encourage knowledge sharing and people not just looking at their own products, but learning from other successes and failures as well. So uh, everyone's got access to absolutely everything. They do know where to focus their attention to if they really want to as well. But ideally, also uh, reading other pieces of information as well. And as you can see, there's this gap between the first two products and the rest. And... We did that because uh, the first two are quite like legacy type of products. So this gap is like visually separating these two from, from the rest. So that's, that's a nice thing to do. And obviously when you use Miro, you can you know, organize things however uh, you, you like and wh whatever works for you really and for your organization. Um, it's also acting as some sort of a live repository uh, live status update. So um, it, it's, it's a bit like Trello board. There's like lists for each product and in each user lane is like another, <laughs> another completed card, but uh, it, it's telling you much more than, than that. It's not just telling you if something was done, you can also see how much you've got. And yeah, you can see um, all the different uh, doing and the done sections as well. There's another section <laughs> on the side there that I'm going to add now. So there's a very active uh, section where, uh, where we're like moving sticky notes around and, and analyzing stuff. And there's a lot of movement there. And then we move stuff from the doing to the done section. I know that it can look quite intimidating <laughs> at this stage, but just remember that what you're seeing right now is a product of months of work and a lot of different iterations to optimize how everything is uh, structured and how everything looks like. So uh, my best advice is to take it one sticky note <laughs> at a time. So yes, yeah, so moving stuff from doing to the done. Um, and if we look back at everything that I just uh, shared, uh, we can now visualize everything in one place and um, see one product generation or all the active products, one product, 
one user lane or one user interview, one question. And the best thing about Miro uh, is the, the built-in functionality. So if you're not really sure what you're after, if it's not following the structure of product question, you know, type of a, of a vibe, then you can also use the built-in functionality to search for a specific keyword and then have some sort of a holistic view to, to everything. So um, you can look for specific themes or other trends that maybe the report is never going to, <laughs> to summarize for you. And obviously there's a lot more to share and, and say about this repository. So uh, more than happy to take your questions and, and um, yeah, dive in deeper if you've got any, <laughs> any specific things in mind. Awesome. Um, I think we do actually have quite a few questions that are popping up in the chat, but I'm going to be really selfish and ask some questions first, <laughs> prioritize my own questions. Um, but I think that was a really interesting and unique way of um, pulling insights together. I've never seen anyone use Miro before, so I thought it was really creative um, and a really nice way to get people to um, to interrogate the data themselves. Um, so that, that's, that's quite a, um, a unique feature of, of Miro, I think. Um, one, some of the questions I have are in terms of um, if you're having stakeholders who are, who are asking you, like, what have we got on this specific thing? Do you direct them to the board or do you use that board as a way of going in and gathering the data yourself and then presenting that in a, in a different manner? How does that work? That, that's such a good question. And, and because it, it was, you know, it's done, uh, it's part of the higher education sector. So it's quite tricky as well to share all of that. Uh, plus the stakeholders in this case are academics. Mm -hmm. so in this specific case, it's the academics that are teaching the courses. So obviously the last thing I want is to share private information of a student telling us something uh, that doesn't work for them, uh -huh. uh, sharing it with, with us, but then, you know, they, they you know, Maybe they didn't plan on that information to uh, go to the academics. So what we did was um, if uh, academics wanted that information, we anonymized it for them. So we deducted all the specific information about names, locations. Sometimes we had to add some context and, and explain you know, the continent at least, or the, you know, to explain that there's a time zone uh, issue but not disclosing specifically who said what, uh, but, but you know, we did make the effort of sometimes duplicating to another mirror board and pseudo anonymizing absolutely everything. And, and then we shared it uh, with stakeholders, but within the product team and within the design and development teams, we did uh, make it, you know, uh, gave view access to absolutely everyone um, mm -hmm. that are doing and creating the courses. Is that information that's in the board? Is it could people identify people? So, like, if you know, if I'm an academic, could I identify who these potential these people are that you've interviewed? No, they okay. can guess, but not not really. Gotcha. <laughs> um, okay. There's there's also many many students uh, attending those programs, so it will be really hard to know who said what. Really, mm -hmm. also, it's it's our. Uh, summary. It's uh, it's our analysis of the interview rather than the entire interview. So yeah, no, it's, I don't think it's possible really. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of like your, so you've got like things on sticky notes. Are you bringing things over from a different board when you're like you and your team are taking notes in like say a usability test or in an interview? Does that come from a different board and it's moved and copied across? Or are you actually taking notes live in that document and then sorting it? So we really tried to, the, the reason to use Miro is for us to not using different, <laughs> you know, for not using different like working areas and then exporting it to the public area. So yes, like it's very active. If you log into the board, you can see people analyzing and, and like analyzing stuff straight into that mirror board, mm -hmm. uh, obviously taking as many copies <laughs> as we can so, so we don't lose information as well. But, uh, but yeah, so it's all done That's in the same really space. I think that's an actually really interesting point for people because mm -hmm. as I think researchers, our job is to not just share research, but I think open up the curtains to what it takes to do research. 
and that it is an active practice. It's not, you know, you research something and then you're done learning. And so I can imagine in some scenarios, and I think the caveat for anyone listening right now is you have to ask yourself, what am I trying to achieve? And I think in Eden's case, it makes a lot of sense to kind of open up the curtains to this like research and making it feel live and interactive. And that kind of live movement of things being sorted helps do that. So I think that's a really interesting kind of question to ask for all of you ask yourselves, you know, like, do, are we trying to kind of get stakeholders more involved in the research? And and maybe this is a really good method to do that. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously that was not the only thing that we did. We also, um, every time we learned something new and we spotted early trends, we, you know, shared, we shared it on Slack you know, there's, there's, there's so much that we can do to communicate early insights, I feel like, because those reports, you know, when you, when you get them, it's, it can be really overwhelming to digest all at once. And obviously, there's like always more than you can squeeze in, in into them. So by doing that, by the time the report is going to come, people already manage to digest some of that and, and make, you know, a few insights of their own even. Amazing. So we have got a few questions. Is that a, how long have we got, Sarah? Another probably 10 minutes or so? Yep, 10 minutes. Okay, good. So, so let, me, let me ask some of the questions from the audience because I know they're probably dying to, to have their questions answered. And I, I think there's quite a lot of questions here so we probably won't be able to get through all of them. Apologies, everyone. Um, I think Dimitri's had his, was the first question. He, he was really interested in the process that you guys went through to create that tagging taxonomy. How did you go about choosing those specific things to, to tag? And then he's also interested in like, what are the biggest pitfalls that you've learned when you're creating that tagging structure? And is there any tips that you would give to kind of avoid those? Yeah, I think, so with the blue labels that are telling you what type of a, of a data it is, always use them. That's, that was like the number one rule. Like if you include things in, in the board, so actually we had like, uh, it, it, it was so zoomed out, so you can't really see it, but there's a lot of like do's and don'ts. <laughs> so before someone's get a, an editing right to the board, they, they need to, to know what to do uh, when they do, uh, when they can edit. And what we decided is always tag what type of data it is. Is it a direct quote? Is it a summary using uh, the user's word? Or and you know the most dangerous, <laughs> the most dangerous one, uh, descriptive, you know, interpretative. Uh, so that that's num- you know number one rule. But the rest, like the positives, negatives, and and neutrals, sometimes you know sometimes it's like you you won't even be able to know <laughs> if it's a positive, uh, negative, or, or neutral. And what is neutral? So um, so when people ask me what is neutral, <laughs> what 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 can we tag with that? So I said. If someone's sharing a point that is both great, but also there's drawbacks to it, you know, all, all of those different contradictions, that's, that's neutral. But to don't force yourself to decide every time if something is positive or negative or neutral. Uh, mm-hmm. Do it only if it makes sense and only according to, you know, what was shared during the interview. But I, we, after doing it for quite a lot of times, we didn't really see uh, the need to add new labels. Also, it's quite time consuming to kind of like rework all the labels that were used. Um, and actually, Maria, that those tags were totally, <laughs> like uh, I, I totally learned uh, uh, that trick from you actually in one of the courses though. <laughs> I, re- I recognized that. that when I saw the, saw the slide. I was like, ah, oh, that looks familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, Great. What, so you mentioned that seems like a little bit of a, a downside with this specific tool that you can't really change those those tags or those codes that you might assign. You, you can kind of rename to, them. Oh, you can rename yeah. them. Okay. You change the color as well, but adding a new tag is quite challenging. So knowing all the tags up front, that's that's the the real you know that's the real challenge to think about what's coming. Right. Yeah, and this might be a little bit challenging for those of you that are just getting started and starting to do some really exploratory research. So that might not be, you know, the the, be- the best approach perhaps for, mm-hmm. for some of you. 
but it certainly sounds like this works really well for um for the work that you're you're currently doing and where you are with with your team and, and carrying out research um any tips so sean was asking like how do you make all of that information like usable searchable and they enable researchers to interrogate those required insights and data i think you've kind of pointed to certain things that you're like the way that the whole structure um is instilled in that document but do you have any other tips in terms of helping people to kind of find things really easily or to interrogate the data and maybe make new connections across um bits of early insight i think you know we as we you know well, I used to work as a researcher for a while, but now um, I manage them. But we really want to share the, you know, the results always. We really want to wait for all the data to be there to back up what we're trying to say. But um, my best advice is to share as early as you start spotting a trend and always saying, you know, I did 10 interviews out of 60. So that's definitely not going to be, you know, something that you can stick to. That's not going to be a fact. That's but it's it's quite interesting though. So you need to know this. Maybe you can already start learning on the go, sharing snippets of, of you know links to the videos or you know and, and as soon as you find out something that's quite interesting that you can learn from already, mm -hmm. then share it. But obviously the reports, you know, it's it's they're still. Uh, writing good reports and uh, actionable insights so people can actually, you know, so, so people will know what to do and what not to do in a way, but you also give them the access to learn why. You, you also give them the access to the data so they really understand the, <laughs> the bottom line of, of your conclusion there. Obviously, that re repository did not replace writing reports and we wrote many. Uh, and all of these uh, reports were, um, you know, nicely designed as much as possible, but also half of the, you know, one page for each question, for example, half of it was a summary of what was said. The other half was always action. So what, what is it that we're now going to do um, with what we know? Um, that's, I think that that's the number one most important thing. Otherwise, people may think that it's a waste of time. Um, so yeah, writing as many actionable insights as possible. Gotcha. Do, do you link out from that board to those reports or, or are they sort of held you know, in a separate place? Is this more just for those early insights? Yeah, I, I link to everything from that uh, research repository, including the, the links to the videos, to the reports, to yeah, all sorts of stuff. So there's a lot of signposting Mm -hmm. down there as well. Tito asks us a question and I'm going to sort of mend his question a little bit um, but he's he's asking like is this do you see this as being scalable so when you you and the team continue to do more and more research like month after month perhaps in the next year do you imagine still sticking with Miro or do you imagine something something having to be introduced to kind of manage the scale of all of those sticky notes um, or coming up with some kind of new structure um, how what, what's your sort of anticipation around around using yeah, I, think, I think in terms of structure you can only think as far as you can sometimes who knows what the next product that you're going to do is going to be and who knows what what structure is going to support that so keeping things as flexible as possible and not to marry an idea <laughs> uh, you know knowing that things are going to change and that board changed many times actually uh, and probably will continue to change uh, in terms of scale, uh, at some point you do need to move to a different mirror board. <laughs> at, at some point it's going to be too big to, to handle all of those different uh, items that it contains. So, but, but at least it's, you know, it's going to be less convoluted than Google folders <laughs> and Excel sheets, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I think just trying to reduce the noise of, of those elements that's the the main point it's not it's there's, it's not a perfect tool i don't think but it's um it's doing a really good job to visualize what we've got one last question then we'll we'll wrap up <laughs> um a practical question how long do you think it took you to get those insights in there and to have them organized just to give people a kind of benchmark mm -hmm. of how long they expect to spend 
to set up and to think about the basic structure that I had initially, that took me a month. And it wasn't just me, it was me and every single, you know, representatives of all sort of roles inside the team. So product owners, designers, developers, you know, all sorts of people collaborated to kind of like say uh, what it is that they need. We basically UX researched and UX designed <laughs> our, our repository all together and thought about the requirements. How long it took me to get the insight sorted? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, after this one month of workshops, we used the same mirror board to analyze and to display everything. So everyone got view access and only the researchers uh, had access to edit the board. So yeah, several months until uh, what I just showed now, but everyone had access to the entire process from just having maybe one or two interviews analyzed to what you just saw. <laughs> now the monster that you just saw now. <laughs>